-hmm. So some housekeeping, because it wouldn't be me if I didn't have something to say about something. Um, uh, this is, I do have a few slides, but mostly it's a demo where you get to work along with me, um, and I'll explain how to do that in a little bit. Also, there's a link to this slide back here. It's a bit.ly link, D-C-A-S-H-V-L hyphen markdown. If you want to follow along, there's some handy links in there instead of trying to get it off of the screen. Um, there are, I can't remember actually, there might be images in the slide deck, but they're purely decorative and add no value, so I won't be um, describing them. Um, and I'm an accessibility person and I like this little thing. I use Google Slides for a reason and I just want to demo this just so people know that it's a tool that you have. Down here in the corner, oops, down here, there's this more setting, right? You can go here and you can put on captions. And what I like to do is I like to have large captions and I put them at the top and I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to toggle them on. And now for people who can't hear or you know maybe I'm talking too fast, there are captions. The reason why I put them at the top is because they're open captions. That means you can't turn them off. So when this is recorded, if you go on YouTube, there's captions at the bottom and I don't want to interfere with that because it would be too much information to look at. But So that's a little handy trick. And if it's distracting, I can turn it off. But if we need it, it's just one of those things that kind of makes it nice, you know? It's AI. It doesn't always pick up what I have to say, but um, it's pretty good. Um, before we get started, um, while I'll tell you about things before the demo, if you want to create an account at trydiscourse.org, it's a little discourse server that's a throwaway 24-hour site that you can practice this markdown as we talk. On one side, you write markdown, and then it renders on the other side. So it's kind of a real good exercise as I'm telling you about these commands. You can go to trydiscord.org and create an account now. It's like you can sign in through GitHub or whatever, you know, um, but uh, if you want to do the demo while I do it. And um, I'll be doing it, like I said, in time so you can follow along or you can watch. My name is Amy Jean Heinlein. I work at the Linux Foundation, but I love Drupal, so I'm still here. Um, you can follow me on Mastodon. There's a Mastodon Drupal community that's really nice, you know, so you can filter your feed from your local community at drupal.community on Mastodon. Okay, so why Markdown? Um, because not everyone likes HTML. Um, plain text files, you know, those TXT files, don't really allow for formatting. You know, as you type, it's just plain text. Um, so things like subheadings, headings, links, you know, they're just what they are, you know. Um, but the MD, uh, crap, sorry, hold on. Um, I need to turn off uh, Slack. Okay. Um, so uh, if you, you use Markdown, you provide an MD file, and that way, if you're in something that renders it, you'll have all those commands, you know, the inline formatting, the headings, they'll display as headings. Um, they, Markdown is like a mix between a text file and HTML. Not everyone can read HTML. So you have a little bit more control with Markdown because it's human readable. And as a writer, or maybe technical documentation, what Markdown allows is you can look at it and you can do formatting. So when you submit your stuff to the maintainer or the editors, you have control over, this is what I want as a heading, this is what I want as a link, this is how I want the link to appear, this is how I want the table aligned, all of those things. And as an editor who might not know HTML, they can read it and kind of follow along. But it gives you a lot more control over your editorial process. It's simple. It's intuitive. Um, it can be converted to HTML. It can be converted to a PDF, which you shouldn't really be using PDFs anyway. It's like, you know, 2023. So, you know, think about if you're using a PDF, why you're using a PDF, but that's a different session. So, um, but, but you can convert uh, Markdown easily to PDF. Um, a lot of editorials or maybe, you know, project pages. Um, uh, it's just, you know, something that is shared across many platforms. But you have to be aware, one of the things about Markdown are there different flavors to Markdown. There's a flavor for GitHub Markdown. There's a flavor for GitLab Markdown. There's flavors all over the place. 
Um, I'm a big proponent of open source, so I don't recommend GitHub, but I know a lot of people like GitHub. So I invite everyone to look at GitLab because some of these things I'm gonna be doing are GitLab flavors of Markdown and they're really cool things, really cool. So um, think about GitLab if you're not already there. Um, I talked about, you know, uh, it works anywhere, you can use it in multiple, you can, you know, export it. And also, there's no toolbar, there's nothing to distract you. You don't have to take your hand off your keyboard to like highlight something in the editor. You can write all of your formatting right there. So it's quicker, you know, than having to like copy some, or, you know, uh, highlight something and hit a button to make it bold. You can just do two keystrokes and, and it's done. Um, and it's a great tool for non-programming types. Um, <clears throat> so applying the basics to Markdown, um, that's just a slide that says that. So um, uh, again, start with an MD file, um, know your flavor, you know, to wrap your head around the concept of Markdown flavors. It's kind of like a dialect, like I speak a little bit differently because I live in California than someone that lives in Tennessee, you know, so those flavors are kind of dialects of Markdown. Um, and everyone has their favorite Markdown, at, well, if you use Markdown, everyone has a favorite Markdown editor. Um, the best advice for me is take your time and find out what works best for you. But I'm using Discourse because it's, it d does the rendering. You don't have to download VS Codium or whatever it is. You know, it's, um... But anyway, again, I like to really iterate that um, Markdown is designed to be readable and unobtrusive, and um, Markdown files can be read even if they're not rendered. So that's kind of cool, right? So open source editors, there's links in there. I don't want to talk about them, but my favorite one is Dillinger. That's a pretty nice markdown. Um, I'm not a developer though, so I don't use an IDE, but lots of IDEs you know, will we'll do uh, the rendering for you. Um, there's some not so cool, not open source uh, markdown editors. Obsidian is a really cool one. Has anyone ever used Obsidian? Oh, it's so cool. Anyway. Well, it's not as cool as the other ones, but there's no open source equivalent to Obsidian. And I need to put my note here so I remember to um, do this. But anyway, so there's some not, not so cool ones. Notice that VS Code is not open source, but if we look back, VS Codium is. So something to think about if you're using VS Code, they track you. So that's another presentation for another day. But. And these are some of the things I'm going to go over. We don't really need to talk about them because I'm going to add files one by one for those. Um, so let's mosey to a demo. Again, you might have discord.org. But I have a GitLab instance, GitLab slash Volkswagen Chick slash Markdown hyphen in hyphen minutes. I'm going to give you a second. If you're on the slide deck, you can click on that. But um, you don't have to go there. But if you want that for reference later, I have everything I'm teaching in Git repository. So with that, um, I'm going to stop the recording. So if you didn't go to Discourse, this is, this is what Discourse looks like, and I'm not gonna use it because um, I'm using, well, I'll, I'll use it too. Anyway, what happens is you type on one side, and there's a toolbar, but you don't need to use that because we're using Markdown. So we're gonna be typing on one side and looking at the rendering on the other. So that's the Discourse thing. Um, uh, what you do when you get there after you open an account, just pick on any of the threads and like open a new thread or open a new topic or I forget how it goes. But Okay, so if we go to my GitLab, you can see this repository, I have all of these files that are MD files. So that was that first step, right? Remember, not text files, but MD files. <clears throat> and I have them all open. My first one is my README because documentation is important, right? Okay, so here's a documentation page written in Markdown, and you can see that it's rendered. Um, the nice thing about these uh, online get instances is you can see it here, and then you can look at the code. So here's just an example of how I used it. You know, instead of highlighting the things, I've got a heading, I've got contents of a file, I have a list, I have links, I have you know, links, so again, like this is just to kind of show you how cool it is. You can read all that stuff and that's what it renders like. But look, 
you can actually read and understand what's happening on this page you know, after you learn a little bit of the syntax. It's readable. I can send it to Carrie, who doesn't like Markdown, and she likes HTML, and she can read this. You know what I mean? It's very readable. So the first thing I'd like to talk about are inline formatting examples. So we're going to talk about italics. Italics, you add one. I'm in such a habit of having it split, I forget I can look at my computer. Um, you can add one asterisk or underscore before and after the word with no space, and you'll have an italics. You can do bold with two asterisks in front and behind with no space, and you have bold. You can do strike down or strike through where you have the line across it. Those are two tildes on either side of the word, two tildes. So again, I'm going to flip over and we're going to look at it rendered. You can see here's my one asterisk before and after and my one or my two asterisks or two, I'm sorry, underscores for italics, asterisks for bold and here's our strike through. So pretty cool. Again, like if I go to discourse, I'm going to, you can see on this side I have underscore italic, but what happens here? Like, oops. So you can see if I have a space, it doesn't render. So I'm just showing you some of these troubleshooting things that you might come across because it's, you know, it's kind of human nature to want to put a space between our things. So you, it's no spaces with the, with the underscore. Again, if you do the asterisks and do bold, you can see it changed it to bold. Strike through the two tildes. And you have strike through. Pretty simple. I didn't have to take my hands off the keyboard. I didn't have to use my mouse and highlight anything. I could do everything right there as I'm typing. Makes it really quick when you're, you know, writing stuff. So there's the, the, that inline formatting I talked about. Headings. We all know that headings are good for accessibility, right? You know, we organize our content in a logical flow, so we have headings, and um, headings can be done in a couple of different ways in Markdown. I'm going to flip over to the code. So you can see when I had the heading, I have the hashtag with a space, headings and breaks, with a, with a um, line break, you know, a, a hard return. So headings work like this. This is GitLab. You have one hashtag for your H1, but look at this. You have two hashtags for heading two, three hashtags for heading three. So it's very, you know, intuitive, right? But again, there's a space in here. So not like the inline formatting. Alternatively, you can have a different way if you're only using two heading <coughs> styles. For the first heading, it's equal signs underneath. And then for heading two, it's hyphens underneath the length of the word. So if we go back and we look at the markup, or you know, it rendered, here's our heading, right? Our heading one, our heading two, our heading three. Remember, headings are not for style. We all know that, right? They're for accessibility, and it's how you organize your content. It's how people would navigate using assistive technology. But there's how we render. Another cool thing in Markdown is you can have horizontal rules. And how you do that, I'm going to flip over. It's three dashed line, just three dashed lines. So if we go over and we look at that discourse, I'm not sure if three dashed lines works, but there we go. There's my horizontal rule. Pretty cool. Okay, so the next thing I'd like to talk about are lists. We'll flip over to the markdown version of the list. You can see that I have it in logical order with my headings. Remember the hashtag with the, with the thing. To create an ordered list, you do your numbers. Or you don't even have to number it. You can just put ones. Okay, so if we flip over, we can see that it created a list for us. And it changed those all ones into our ordered list. So that's pretty cool. If we go down a little bit, we have unordered lists. I'm gonna flip over to the, there's a few different ways to do unordered lists. You can do 
dashes, asterisks, or plus signs in first. So here we see a dash, right? We have an asterisk, or we have a plus sign. So if we flip over and look at the, the rendered output, here's our dashes, here's our asterisks, and here's our plus sign. They all render the same. So can we ask questions? Sure. So I'm wondering, like, when you exported, the, let's just say you did all these different combinations and then you export the HTML, is it going to be different or the same? Because I'm just thinking if there's, like, a benefit to certain markdown versus the other, because of the, especially because you're talking about AT, like, is one going to be rendered one way for the AT? Like, the fact that you did one, 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 you know, but then the markdown converted it, what is the, I don't have the answer to that. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah, I don't, because I don't use HTML, you know, so I... The question, the question was, um, with the different flavors of Markdown, do they all render the same when it converts to HTML? And I said I didn't have the answer to that. So, so the, the HTML renders the same, but it's whether or not the Markdown flavor is recognized by wherever you are. So, like if you did one 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 in in, in uh, GitHub, um, it wouldn't recognize it because it automatically numbers itself. So that's the difference. So it's a, it's a matter of whether or not whatever flavor you're looking at is understood, that it renders the same HTML. Yeah, but that's a different answer to the question, but we can talk about that one later. Good question. We'll figure it out. So combining the two, you know, we had the ordered lists and the unordered lists. So we're looking at, you know, the, the markdown. Here's our ordered list. And then to have, you know, uh, you know, the, the what's it called, the sublist or subtask. Um, you do spaces until it, it reaches the margin, and then you do, you know, your combination. So if we look at that rendered, you can see, oops, that it indented it and gave us our bullet points. So I'm going to flip over and so you can look at it one more time. So combining the two, we have our ordered list with our numbers. We indented until what's I call a hanging indent, and then we have our unordered list. Links, I'm not going to go over all the different kinds of links because this is sort of a basic session, but we're going to look at like just how to create a link, right? So you can see there's links here, kind of, you know, it's hard to tell, but they're blue. Um, we have they all kind of look the same, right? They're just blue. But there's a few different ways that you can write links in Markdown. First is you can use brackets immediately followed by parentheses. So I have the link text in my brackets and then I have the URL afterward. So I have Drupal Camp Asheville, no space, and then my URL. You can add a title to the link by doing the same thing, right? We have our brackets with our where we're going, the rendered part, our URL. And then we have in quotes, Drupal Camp Asheville's homepage. So we're gonna see that when we flip back, but I gave it a title. So here's a relative link within the same repository. Does that make sense, what a relative link is? It's in the same URL group, but a different page. So we have what I wanted to say, go back to lists. So I have the relative link, you know, blob, main, list, MD. So that's what how you get back to um, uh, in a relative link. But there's also like quick ways to do it, but before we talk about that, let's look at that output again. So here we are, you know, here's that. They all kind of look the same, right? But you can write them in different ways. So we added um, a title. Do you understand when we add a title to a link what that means? So if we hover over Drupal Camp Asheville, that one that I added the quotes to, down here, maybe that's not the right one. Oh, well, it doesn't work. No, no, the first one works. Oh, did it? Yeah, because it's over the, the title is actually shown over the... Oh, there we go. Okay. Right here. <laughs> I was looking down here. So here, <laughs> that's adding the title. That way people can look at it and have, like, you know, say you don't have, like, a human readable thing or whatever, and you just want to do that. So that's how we added that title. Within those parentheses, we did a quote, right, with the name of our, of our page. So email addresses, you know... Um, 
those are pretty straightforward too. Um, let's flip over to the code. You can do it two different ways. You can do it in our greater than, less than signs, right? Could, could I ask you to define what you mean by a, re a repository? Okay, so we're in GetLab right now. And if we go back to home, this is all, this is, this is my repository. Okay. So everything starts with the same URL. And when I say relative link, it's this part afterward, the page. Okay. So this is the main repository and we're linking so, back to pages. Uh, a repository would also be a path if you're on a file system and if you're yep. out on the web, it, it's a, got a URL in front of the path. Yep. Okay. Yep. So if we go back to lists, right? It takes us to the list page. Okay, so email addresses. You can see I did not do a hard line break, so there's a mistake there, so let's correct that. Simple, straightforward to do. We go here, we hit edit, edit a single file. Come over here, add a break, commit my changes. And typically, you know, you're really supposed to like define what you changed, but we're going to be sloppy because sometimes we're sloppy. We're going to commit the changes, but now when we go back, we can see that, you know, I needed a hard break in between those or it showed up on the same line. So again, we just put them inside brackets and they rendered as links, email links. Tables. Tables are cool. So, so if people know this is a table, you know, you've got your, your, your headings and you have your data and things like that. But let's look at how it looks in Markdown. So we have tables that are left aligned. So what we're doing is we have the pipe key, you know, that's underneath your delete key, the pipe key. We have pipe key with spaces on both sides. These are our titles and tables that are left aligned. To left the line, I define it here. In between my pipe, I have a colon on the left side. And then I, here I have my data. Again, spaces in between the pipes and the data. And we're gonna switch over real quick and see what I mean. So we go here, here's that heading I defined. Here's our columns. And look, they're all left aligned. So if I go back and we look at right aligned, all I did was define it on the other side. So now I have my data right aligned. And we don't need to flip over because we know what that looks like. But you can also do center aligned by putting the colons on both sides. So we have the left aligned with the colon on the left, the right aligned, center justified here. But then you can also mix it up a little bit. So I have, you can see I have left the line for this column, left the line, or center justified for this column, and right aligned there. So let's look back and see what it looks like. We have our left aligned, we have our right aligned, we have our center aligned, and then we mixed it up a little bit. Just the definition was that colon. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can see here that you can do inline formatting in your table, you can leave spaces blank. So again, we had our pipes that kind of define you think, you know, the row or the columns. We had spaces, and look at this, we're gonna look at this render because we did a little bit crazy stuff and mixed it up. You can see that I left that blank, so there was that blank space. Here I have some inline formatting, and columns don't need to be aligned, you know? So, but anyway, again, you're defining it with those colons. So, so this is pretty cool. This is one of my favorite things. We're coders, or some of us are coders, um, so we have code formatting. Um, Quick question about the tables. Sure. Are the headings always just center aligned? Are the headings only center aligned? Um, yes. I don't know if you can do it different, but that's the way I do it. So, but that's a good question. But just as it is, yes. 
I didn't define it, so I think that's the default behavior to have it center aligned. That's a good question. So back to the code blocks, right? Um, so there's two different ways to do code blocks. You can do an inline code block or you can do a code block, you know, big center thing. So we're gonna look at the markdown for that. So we have inline code. So how we define the inline code is with back ticks. That's that under the tilde, back tick, not a quote, but a back tick. So we have I love Drupal with the back tick, no space. And then we have code blocks where we have three back ticks hard return and then three back ticks afterwards. So you can see that it looks different, right? So we're gonna look at that again. We have our inline formatting and then we have our code block. And then your CSS and your templates and your styles are gonna define what these look like you know, on your web page. You can have highlighted green or whatever, but that's defined in your templates, right? But this is the code block and this is and this is our inline. And the reason why I like Markdown, if you're writing an article, you know, um, you'll see lots of people submit their code blocks as screenshots. Well, that's not really accessible because you can't copy and paste from a screenshot. Sure, you could put it in the alternative text, but then that's another step for someone to have to go through to get that thing. So code blocks are really nice for, for, for when you're reading an article, you can copy and paste it, and it's a really the responsible way to you know, show that it's a code block, that way people can use your code. So again, it's a back tick before and after, and then three here, and we'll look at it one more time just because it's so much fun. Okay. This is where I get into my GetLab stuff. That's really cool GetLab flavors. Okay, so we have flow diagrams. Look at this. You can do this in Markdown. How cool is that? Okay, so these are unique to GetLab, just so you all know. But you can, you know, define them. So we're going to look at the, at the code. So I don't know what this means. I just use it just for honesty. It's it's a, a code block, right? We have our ticks. It's mermaid. I don't, is that a name of a flow diagram? I don't know, but mermaid. And then we have graph, TD for table data, and a semicolon. So we're defining our paths to our charts. We have A going to B, colon. We have A going to C. We have B going to D. And we have C going to D. So let's look at that again. We define that. A went to B. A went to C, and then B and C went to D. So imagine having to like open up your Figma. Oh, I should knock that. We have someone open up whatever thing that you use. And, you know, it's a call. You're dragging stuff. You're copying. You're pasting. You're moving it, and like it's just so much work to do a flowchart in a in a design program where you can do it with a couple pretty relative simple keystrokes in Markdown. So let's look at this other one I have at the bottom. We defined it, again, you make the rules. So I have A going to B, A going to D, B going to D, and D going to C. So it's just a pattern, right? And you can play around with it and have pretty, you know, pretty um, wild rides in your flow diagrams. But look, I defined it. We had A to B, we didn't do, we didn't do A to C this time, we went all the way to D, and then D went to C. And you can do all kinds of things, so. Couple of keystrokes, no opening another program, not you know a file you have to share that can open up uh, on someone else's computer. Yes, Adrian. It does work in Joplin. Does it? Okay. Joplin's a really good one too. I use Joplin from time to time, so so that's good to know. So get GitLab flavors, but you know as GitLab opens up more and becomes a developer's tool of choice because it's open source, where GitHub is not. I think more renderers and more programs are catering to that GitLab style of Markdown, so that's what's nice. Um, and then the last example I have is a task list. Look how cool this is. So you have check marks, right? Again, this is all keystrokes. We have tasks, we have stripes, you know, we have, well, don't look at this one because that one's really exciting and gets my heart moving, but we have task lists, like, you know, so I look at it in the markdown, and it's really not that complicated. We add bullets, 
right? Remember our bullets, our dashes, our pluses, our asterisks with the space. Um, and to complete it, or you, then you have your brackets. So we have a bracket here with a space. There's a space here. We struck through something. Remember that inline tilde that we used? We completed a task with X. Let's look at it again. So we completed a task. We struck out a task that we're not doing anymore. But we don't want, like, say someone doesn't know to look back in the Git history. Someone who might not be technical wants to know that that task existed, but we want to know that it's irrelevant, so we strike it out, right? Look, there's that combination of moving those subtasks over. We did that combination, so we'll look at it one more time. We did that indenting, right? Remember the hanging indent? So we have subtasks strike through and completed a task. So that's nice, it renders it as a checkbox, you know, it's pretty fancy, you don't have to use Jira. So, you know, and here, remember, we have an ordered list too where we didn't have to define the numbers. So I just did a couple of combinations so you can see that. But it looks kind of fancy and cool and we didn't take our fingers off of our keyboard the whole time, we didn't open up another program, we don't have an emoticon checkbox. That's a, a presentation too about the use of emoticons and how they're not accessible. You should not have an emoticon in your code repository, period, okay? There's no reason for it. Don't smirk. <laughs> screen readers love emoticons and that's why I say it because if you've ever done a screen reader, like, like you know how on Twitter some people, again, it's another talk, but I have some time to tell you my rant about emoticons. So if you have like, like a tweet, for example, and you shouldn't be on Twitter, but if you are, that's a talk for another day too. So you have you have your tweet and you have like, you know, your ta-da, 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 red heart, you know, and you have all these emoticons. A screen reader will read, they love emoticons. They will read every single one of those emoticons in line. So imagine you can't access it ver uh, visually and you have a screen reader reading to you 15 emoticons in a row. Are you gonna get to that text th that you actually wanna read? No, because you're so tired of hearing red heart, blue balloon, whatever. So if you do use emoticons, keep them to the end of your tweet. Keep your hashtags to the end. Don't put them in your code repositories was the moral of the story, but that's why, you know what I mean? It, you, anyway, anyway. <laughs> live demos, I can talk. Anyway, so we have drop downs. I have a question here. I have, what is the best Drupal camp in the world? Anybody know? <laughs> Watch this. So these are in order. Um, these are my answers, but they're ordered, you know. And so it's Asheville, and it's Florida, and it's Colorado, right? So look at that, we have a drop down right there and we hit it. So I'm gonna do that little trick again so you can see how cool that was. Look at that, a drop down. And I did not have to put my, open up another program, figure out any code. All I had to do was, oops. A little bit of words, I have details in my brackets. Here's my question, that's my summary. Question one, what is the best Drupal camp in the world? And I ended my summary. And then I have my answers with breaks in between, because if you don't, it'll appear on the same line. So I have answer one, Asheville with a break. And then I close my details, right? Remember your opening and your closing tags. So we have details, we have the summary the closing tag and then we have our answers and we close that detail. So let's look at it one more time because it's so cool. I don't know, that's pretty neat. So that is uh, all the, well that's not all the cool things I like to do in Markdown but those are kind of the straightforward ones and it shows you the power of like what you can do without having to open or code or do anything and not take your hands off the keyboard. So Markdown's a really accessible way for some people to write. Like say you have uh, a tremor or maybe, you know, uh, uh, right now I can't grip very well so I can't use a mouse, you know, so it, it's less work for me to not have my hands leave the keyboard. And it's human readable. Like I said, you know, you can go back and forth and someone who is, you know, the editorial manager who doesn't know any code 
they can see basically what you're trying to do. Again, we're going to look at that README. You know, I have control over the styling. I have control over, I want the editor to know that, hey, this is the second heading. And the reason this is important too is, you know, and I talk a lot about editorial because my, my most recent job, my not current job most recently, I'm a little lost for words. I was on the editorial team for a publication, and people would send us Google Docs, and we'd have to transfer that into Drupal. Well, Google Docs, when you transfer it, if you just do the straight copy and paste, you've got spans, you've got divs, you've got all this crud. So you have to do the whole you know, paste without formatting, but then you don't have your headings, and then you don't have all your stuff. So it's a lot of work on the editorial team to translate a document from Google Docs. So if someone just wrote their thing, had a couple of keystrokes, you know, and this is just basic. You don't have to do a flow chart. You don't have to do a table, but it saves your editorial team a lot of work because they have to go back and they have to look at the Google Docs, see where the headings is, and did they form, you know what I mean? So it just gives you a little bit more control over your information. And the reason why I do this, too, in Markdown is... Um, you know, we had Drupal 7 and Drupal 6, remember those? And we still have Drupal 7, I guess. <sighs> anyway, that's a whole thing for another day, too. But so when we started in Drupal 7, we came from Drupal 6, we had our readmes in the TXT files, so they didn't render, right? So I like to encourage people to write documentation, for one. But now in Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 and Drupal 10, we have Markdown. So we don't use those TXT files for our readmes anymore. So what I did to show you, I have um, uh, the gen admin theme here, and this is how we style, and this is like kind of a bonus thing if you, do, do, documentation in Drupal is a template. So, and it's markdown, we have contents of the file, we have our headings, we have our links and stuff like that, but it's pretty exciting to learn this because then when you write the documentation, you're following our best practices in Drupal and someone doesn't have to go in there and fix it. So. Kind of a cool thing. Here's our code. Yeah, I wanted to back up just a little bit. So I have a GitHub account, and it does do flow diagrams. Oh, does it? Okay. It didn't um, a month ago, I don't think. So people are catching up. They recently did have an upgrade. Okay. Yeah. It's hard to compete, I think, you know, yeah. with the flavors. But then there's some styles that just don't do it in some things, you know, so prepare for that. You know, know your style. Check out your editors to make sure the style that you use renders, you know, if that's something that you share across your team. So know your flavor of Markdown. And it's just a little bit different. Like I said, it's dialects. Maybe there's a space or maybe it's a, you know, just a subtle difference between the different flavors. So that's a pretty cool tool. I think it's pretty powerful. So. Is there any thought to bringing Markdown into CK? Oh, so that's why it's relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Okay, so Drupal 10's latest release, we updated from CK Editor to four to five. How exciting is that? We're actually relevant and current and open source. But there is the ability to do markdown now in Drupal core, in your basic, not all markdown, but the basics, the inline formatting and stuff like that, brand new with the latest release. 10.1 or 10.0? 10.1. 10.1. Ah. A minor release. It came out in a minor release. How yeah. cool is that? Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I get passionate. <laughs> I, I always get lost. In, in a, okay, so I realize the rendering is being done by the repository program mm -hmm. in GitLab mm -hmm. and being displayed in the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, and, and it's nice having the little button that you're switching from rendered back and forth. But is there a tool, either uh, an online browser-based um, tool or an editor that is, that can render, you know, an editing tool on, on my workstation that I can use that will render that could give me um, real-time, uh, uh, down at the bottom, I would like full width and about maybe four to five lines of rendered um, of rendered markdown that is that is uh, movable, scrollable, uh, and 
I'd love to have then the, the lion's share of the of the rows allocated to the markdown that I'm working with, but I'd just like to have this sort of scrolling full width render display that, that's not uh, hiding behind a button where I have to flip okay. back and forth. So I don't use VS Code, but Mark told me what you can do is you can have the tabs open. You can pop out the tab into a different window. Oh, okay. So you have the tabs. Yeah, you, can, you can arrange them anyway as well. So yeah, VS Code automatically render, can render theirs. I mean, Discourse, so there's a other software that you can view it as well. That's what I'm doing right now. VS Code, it's got the preview on the right side. Okay, so you're doing right and left. Yeah, but you can move that around. That's, yeah, you can, pop, your, you can pop the tab out and have it on a different screen. What I'll do in Dillinger is I have what I'm working on and then I have the rendered on my, you know, I'm working here and I have my rendered stuff on my external monitor. I just popped it out. Yeah. Yeah. Cypress IO, is that what you said? Dillinger, Dillinger yeah. yeah. That's my favorite one. Yeah, it so. a bit than Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. It's a. It doesn't like. Like I said, the flavors are not always catching up with. You know, people, especially the open source ones. You have to put in a feature request and be like, "Hey, can you do this?" And then someone has to work on it. You know, and so as we come up with like different styling, it takes a lot of the on the open source things a little bit to catch up to the different dialects and flavors. So, cool. Like I said, like I'll show you my tables again. Love them. Pretty cool, you know. Our flow charts, pretty cool. Task lists. Oh, I can look here. You know, but again, you know, and that was the whole point of it <laughs> was I was so excited that Markdown is coming to core in Drupal. So it's pretty relevant to learn, you know. So um, because right now, there's a markdown module, but it's not ready for Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. And so um, some people are holding off on going to updating their website from Drupal 7 because they didn't have this module ready for, because they write, like to write in markdown. The module wasn't ready for Drupal 9 and Drupal 10. So it's very exciting that it's working its way into core. Um, when I was in a conference um, that was more open source, not so niche as Drupal, um, the CK editor folks were there and I had a conversation with them about writing an a, a article for um, opensource.com and they were talking about how they're opening up CK editor to more things like Markdown and so um, the world is catching up with it. So, yeah. Fun? Interesting? Learn anything? Nice. Okay. There's little things like those spaces are important. Some stuff has spaces in between the syntax and some doesn't. So there's a little bit of memorization to go on. Remember when we did the inline formatting, there was no space between the word and the, the syntax, but then when we had our hashtags with our headings, there was a space. And then say your lines are messed up and it's all in one line, you usually need to have a like an empty line underneath. So that's a tr common troubleshooting thing is everything being on the same line. You gotta have an empty line. Um, maybe this is off topic, but um, one of the interesting things when you start to pro proliferate small files on your workstation that that are carrying topical information is that you know you usually have to go to a folder. If you keep those sorted by folders, you have to go to the folder, put the file there, and then work the file. Um, is there any, are there any tools that are evolving that are using Markdown to give the operating system file <coughs> instructions about where a portion of, of um, text should be stored? So in effect, you're using Markdown to pass a path instruction to I don't have the answer to that. I'm a Luddite by heart. 
Um, I don't do much like the sysadmin side, so I don't have the answer to that. I know what you're asking, but I don't. The interesting thing is that Mark Allen is, is full of, of ways to inform the rendering to how to display, mm -hmm. but the other big duty of, of um, you know, the operating system is to put something somewhere and, and or, or to d divide things. Um, and, and that involves navigating in a path and... So that's more command line stuff, right? Yeah. Oh, and I'm out of time. But um, do you run Linux by any chance? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's a very good question from a Linux user because you have more control over finding that stuff. I just don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Well, you know, when you were talking about 